And then you're constantly asking for feedback from them as to where they are. So they get very good at defining their emotions, their states of consciousness, which gives them a handle on what's happening right. to them and gives them a lot more power in the situation. So uh, uh, I'd say that the classes are this kind of mixed game of working with, like some people I'll put together in a living situation in a house. Mm -hmm. And then the whole dynamics of that house situation become grist for the mill of our becoming conscious together. So because it really is, is, if not functioning in the world in the sense of... It, it's in the world in the day. It's still it's within a Absolutely. frame. Absolutely, they've all got to earn a living. Right. They live right in the city. Uh -huh. They rent their own houses. I mean, it's all that stuff. At the same moment, they have all made the commitment that their entire life is dedicated to going to God. So that everything they're doing is in relation to getting to God. So that I have total say, if you will, or total liberty. They've given me license to involve myself with their lives at every corner, every junction. So in a way, it's like a city ashram, if you will, except it doesn't have any institutional identity, and I can walk out anytime I want to, which is <laughs> the only way I could do it. This message is coming across strong and clear lately. Last week with Swami Amar Jyoti, there was a uh, discussion of listening to the conscience as the first step before you can go on to hear the inner voice, that you can't let yourself yeah. off the hook. You've got to listen and you've got to act on it. Mm. And you can't say, well, next time or qualify something. And, uh... Well, you can make the distinction between people who, I made it last night, I think, I'm not sure, uh, who want to want God and those who want God. Right. See, I'd say most of us, most of the time, want, want to, to want, want God. They, they sort of want to be aimed in the right direction, but they don't want to shake the game too much. They don't want to give up or risk. They're not ready to say, okay, you take my life and get me to God, all right? You can have it all. I don't want it. I'll do it all. Anything you say, I'll do. That's the act of surrender. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're surrendering to somebody who doesn't want you. They just want you liberated, really. You know, and that's the uh, the the way you've got to trust intuitively. Like I realized I was ready to be a teacher when I didn't really want to see anybody anymore. See, as long as I kept wanting to collect people, I distrusted my own teaching. But now my teaching comes out of a whole different motivation. I really look at a being and I see only where they're not. Mm -hmm. I see their soul, which I love incredibly, and then I see the stuff that's keeping them from knowing who they are. And that just brings out of me my Kali nature. It brings out that sword, and I just go after it. And it's all very automatic. I, I function just like a computer. It really is incredible when I'm in that teaching role. In fact, I get myself into a certain space through meditation. I come into a space where there is no more Ramdas. There's just this incredible instrument for purification. There was a time when you'd say, work through things, do anything, but be conscious of it. Well, uh... Now you seem to be saying no. You know, no, I'm not exactly that saying voice. no, uh, because if you say no at the wrong time, it's all a matter of timing. If you mm -hmm. say no at the wrong time, the person spends all their time being preoccupied with that no. Right. See, the game is at which point can you give something up and then take that energy and redirect it somewhere else? If you, if you give it up, but you can't quite give it up, and you spend your time being preoccupied with having given it up, you are reinforcing the thing itself, the reality of that thing like lust, for example. So if you walk down the street and you start to get horny, if you can at that moment offer that and put your mind into something that will open you and take that energy and work with it, great. If you can't do it and you just sit around being horny all day, uh, forget it. That's not getting you any closer to God at all. The game is to get to God, not to be holy. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, right. the, that's the difference, that there's a real thing to do here. And so that you get less caught in the, in the rituals and forms than in the getting there, right? So that I have nothing wrong with telling somebody, uh, you go ahead and jerk off for a while. That's all cool because you've got all that stagnant energy. You can't use it anyway. You might as well get rid of it. You know, just don't create a lot of karma with it, right? Because they can't use that energy anyway. Later, they can take it and convert it and work with it. When do you know that point? Yeah, when that's... you know you can work with it? 
Right. Along that same line, what I wanted to, you were mentioning surrender and putting your trust in that. And you mentioned uh, the game that's going on. There are a lot of people ostensibly playing that game of offering God. And I think it would be um, interesting if you could share how, when, how you decide, how you gave a surrendered and at some point and decided to give your trust to someone and say, okay, here it is, you know, I'm here, take over. Because there are a lot of people running around saying, here, follow me, you know, I've got the answers. And how does someone know? Uh, it isn't a process where suddenly you know completely. Um, in this particular scene, um, I've had the, in a way, the heavy burden because uh, um, I had to face all the doubts. After all, this woman that I'm studying with is the most unlikely figure to follow, right? Uh, but then so was Maharaji in India. But uh, with Maharaji, I had Bhagwan Das, who I felt was spiritually connected, and I thought I trusted that, and I felt his power immediately. And it was a spiritual scene around him, but this wasn't even a spiritual scene particularly that heavily. And uh, I faced hundreds of hours of doubt, you know? And then each time, I would have to rerun my tapes of the whole thing that had happened and see the basic purity of it. And all I knew is every time I took a sounding, here was this being who was totally committed to my liberation. And I couldn't find an edge in the whole game. And the more I kept running my paranoia through, and she would taunt me about that paranoia, you know, she would taunt me about my doubt. The more, and she'd often demand I give up the doubt, which just increases the doubt, of course. You know, when somebody says, I'm your teacher, and I demand you give up any doubt of me as being the perfect teacher, right? That just works with your doubt. And then you've got to decide at that moment, look, am I going to go the trip or am I going to sit back? Right? And all I knew was that this was the purest, most connected vibration that I could find around. And I wanted to get on bad enough to go you know, and to eat my own doubts. And uh, uh, I think that the process of listening and trusting your own intuitive judgment, like I've seen a lot of people today who have been with one master or another here on the West Coast, and they say, well, there's something in me that keeps me from doing this. Should I treat that as a weakness in me, as they tell me it is, or should I listen to it? And my whole statement always has been listen to it. You may be wrong, but it's okay. Better to train yourself to tune to your own inner voice. You know, although at some point, your inner voice will tell you to do things that go contrary to every other part of your ego, and you'll be mm. screaming. I remember um, being invited to go and sit at the uh, at, uh, Rohatsu Dai Sushin at the... Uh, with Sasaki Roshi down in Southern California, up in um, Mount Baldy. And it was a nine day winter sashin. And it was, I've talked about this one before. Yeah, I it's think, a great you know? story. And I went and I didn't think I was professional. I've, I'd never sat Zazen and they said, oh, you can do it. And uh, I came in, it was miserable. It was cold, the food was lousy. They had me up at two in the morning and down at 10 and I got sick. And by the third day I had a sore throat and a cold and I thought maybe I could use an excuse and get out. And I got very paranoid and how could I get rid of it? And at that point, though I was plotting how to escape, which I have done in this scene many times and I did with Maharaji many times, I was plotting the way to escape. I knew in my inner being that this was really, really just what I needed. And I knew that I had to stay in it. And here was a situation where my inner voice was going contrary to every other part of my being, my health, my desires, my uh, model of who I was and all that. You know? So I trust that voice that it's not necessarily choosing the, inner, the easiest way. It is tuned to getting me home. That's it. It's tuned to getting me to God. There's no doubt about that now. And uh, often it will take one part of my game and work on it and completely ignore another part. And I'll be very loose in one area of my life. And then, because it doesn't seem ready to play with just yet. You know? And then I'll go turn on it and clean it up. And I'm very uh, fluid in the way I 
play with my own desire systems and so on. I mean, uh, I play much more loosely than I play now before, you know, mm -hmm. like now I am brahmachari and that's that. I mean, that's, that's, that one is over now. But only when you could reach a point where you weren't giving it up, you were surrendering. Yes, I and not only that, but I was starting to get something in return that was a uh, hell of a lot more than what I was giving up, which was uh, made it a little nicer. So. <laughs> now, at some point, your inner voice or your conscience uh, said, or your intellect, I don't know, it's hard to, to pin down, said, well, you don't keep uh, pornographic pictures around if you're going to be brahmacharya. Uh, you don't go to a porno flick, which... At yeah. one point, you yeah. were yeah. relating, you know, that you had been in a line. Yeah. Well, you get to the point <laughs> where you have screwed around for so many years. I mean, I'm 44 years old now. Either I'm going to spend my rest of my life being a spiritual dilettante mm -hmm. and being sort of somebody who's always talking about the other guys who made it, or I'm going to do it. And at some point, you say, look, here... I mean, that's really what she was confronting me with, right. what Maharaji was saying. Okay, let's go do it now. You know, you've talked about it so nice, and you got into the middle place, but you, why don't you go the whole trip yeah. right now, okay? And once you make the decision to do that, then every act comes up, is it getting me there or isn't it? And there's no sense in it. There's right. no sense in feeding those other desire systems in yourself because you're just making the damn job harder. And either don't go or go. So this is where your discrimination tells you what to do. Yeah, exactly. And just what is, exactly. is contributive and what is detrimental. And it's got to be with every... And that's what you start listening to. That's what you start listening to. And your criterion is very simply, is it going to get me there, isn't it? Right. You know? And that's who you're with and what you talk about and what you say. It was... Uh, um, yeah. No outs. Hmm? You don't allow yourself any outs. No. No, you don't. It was interesting because uh, I had a number of visitors today who I could have uh, talked about a lot of other things with. Uh, politics, a lot of things. And it was interesting because all we talked about was God because that's all that interests me. God and how to get to God. And, uh, uh, whereas at one point you would use those as devices at one point to speak I would about have, God. I, yeah, or I would have played whatever other games were available oh. that our shared consciousness could play. I mean, like Jerry Rubin came by today. Well, Jerry and I have a long history together. Uh, I was speaking to Owsley, and Owsley and I have a long history together. Um, tonight, uh, I had a very special visitor. Uh, Jerry Brown, the governor, came by to say hello, and he and I could talk about thousands of things, about prisons and politics, and we talked about God all the time. We talked about states of samadhi and uh, opening of the spirit, and we just had a fantastically beautiful uh, hour together of just talking about God. And to me, that was... Uh, See, because that's all that I've got left. You know, I looked and I thought, here's the governor. What do I want? And I don't want anything. I mean, all I saw was that the what only you both reason. Want. <laughs> exactly. I mean, our work is something different now. It's very beautiful together. Very informal and very loving and gentle. God, that, that would look nice in the Sunday paper on the front page. What? Uh, Jerry Brown and Ram Dass talking about God. It'd be interesting. On Sunday, yeah, in the religion section. <laughs> <laughs> on the front page. I think it. Well, I don't think I was betraying any confidence that I mean that we visited. That seemed like a sure. It's not like a, seems right somehow. Jerry Ford's son uh, having Bianca uh, J J in the Lincoln room. She <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> oh. feels good to be here. <laughs> and maybe Krishna Das can play something for us. That would be nice. You do that. Krishna <clears throat> plays a dotara. Huh? What is a dotara? I see one string or two? Got two strings. And it's, it's a, not an a gourd? It's not an it's official a gourd, instrument. yeah, with a skin over the pole. And a very long Bridge neck. Oh. And I should tell our listeners that this is KQED FM in San Francisco. You're listening to New Dimensions. We're going to go past midnight tonight with 
through the graciousness of KQED, and we thank them for that. Ram Das and Krishna Das transcend. Just touch me one at a time to stop.
jaya ma jaya ma shi ma che ma che che ma shi ma che ma che khali ma shi ma che ma Nice stuff, isn't it? That's the that's the love of the mother. That's the devotion of the mother. By any other name, just a sweet. We have a phone call on line one. If you'd like to take a phone call, I think we should share. Sure, share this evening, but. Listeners. Hello. Hello. Do I have to turn down the uh, volume? No. No, you're okay. All right. Um, yes, I would like to ask Ram Das. Um, how can I say? Well, first of all, I'm gay. Second of all, I'm a member of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous for the last five years. And I've been in to be here now since I came across this in 72. And... Um, in my halfway together searching, I have uh, gone to a number of different uh, disciplines, spiritual communes or whatever, the Krishna people in Boston, uh, sort of an AA thing uh, called Eastridge, which is upstate New York, and uh, the Ananda Meditation Retreat in Nevada City. Anyway, all of these people, one way or another, 
either are intolerant of uh, homosexuality, gayness, or have sort of uh, like, yeah, there's two other people here that are somewhat like that, you know. It's either intolerance or uh, sort of a nigger position. Of course, at the moment, I still have a lot of emotional investment in this area, and I was just wondering if Ram Das could say anything about... Uh, one, a lineage that doesn't have any particular bias on uh, sexual orientation. Um, yeah, I guess that's about it. I'm just wondering, quite frankly, at where I'm at right now, the only places that I've found you know, total acceptance is in uh, the gay aspects of Alcoholics Anonymous, which even AA, not gay, is totally... Mm embracing. Yeah, I hear you. Or question. the NCC church. Mm -hmm. But other places, there's always, like, I have a letter from uh, Swami Kriyananda. I was very impressed with the Ananda village and their meditation retreat. But his letter, you know, really just says, hey man, you know, uh, normal sex is, is something you got to grow away from. Abnormal sex is, you know, doesn't even perpetuate people. I'm sorry my feelings may hurt you, but I have to let you know where I'm at. That's what his letter in general says. Hmm. That's my question. Right. I have it. Now I should hang up, right? You can. You All right. It's okay. The, uh... We, earlier we were talking about, uh... A lot depends on what stage you're at in the journey and what kind of commitment you want to make. Um, the recognition that you are a being who has uh, incarnated into a body and into a psychological situation and that your soul or that part of you which is what awakens or what you recognize yourself to be as a result of your spiritual work is actually neither male nor female and really hasn't much to do with the whole uh, drama of our psychological uh, identities. 